Um, okay, here we are, horizontal position. Now, um, Bob Inger divided these up in a really clever way. He, he divided the horizontal position into, it, it's always, well, we often find amphibians and reptiles close to water for a var variety of different reasons. So he very quickly identified permanent streams or rivers or intermittent or temporary streams or rivers. And with these codes, you can identify whether you're on a big river that's permanent or an intermittent stream. And that's really important. If you're an amphibian um, that has a biphasic life um, stage <laughs> style, you're going to be clustered around permanent bodies of water or waters that are reliable um, so that you can count on them for a, a site for laying eggs and developing larvae. Um, so whether it's a permanent stream or an intermittent stream or temporary stream or pond is, is actually a really important bit of information that you'll want to know. But here you can see all the different things. In water of pond, on bank of pond, above water, um, exposed bed of permanent stream bed, add distance from the water, all these different things that you could put in here. We usually end up using these, cup, these top ones, permanent stream, A, B, or C. A being in stream, like actually in the water, versus on the midstream or on a sandbar or on a rock or a debris snag, or on the bank, and you add distance from the bank um, from the stream bed every time you record that. And so you put here like, I would just put C, two meters, and that would tell me that the frog was collected on a bank and it was two meters from the edge of the water. Vertical position is also complex and there's lots of categories, but um, B through D corresponds to, well, um, you can just look at these for yourself, all the different ways, on the surface of soil, um, H, we use something like H a lot because amphibians are often collected on rocks on the banks of rivers, so I'd write H, 30 centimeters, telling us that I collected this thing on a bank rock. 30, that was 30 centimeters diameter, or a big boulder um, that was two meters high, and you just estimate these distances. Um, and it's, the idea is not to have you out there with a measuring tape, measuring the, the widths and diameters of things, but just to give you, to estimate them so you have a, si a, a sense of the size. Because a lot of frogs preferably have very specific microhabitat preferences, and so they tend to be on little rocks on the, ba on the bank of the river, or they tend to be perched on high banks, high perches way above the water, like on big boulders. So those things really matter. And we've added other categories here, like, whoop, like um, um, in the grass, or on sand or gravel, or on the shingle on the side of the way of the river, a shingle, or a temporary pool in a rock depression, all these different things. And you can add other categories to them to your own, to your own need. Um, okay, so we have vertical posi horizontal position and vertical position. Those are the really important ones. Of course, DBH of the tree I won't describe in detail. Obviously, if it's a, something that's perched in a tree, you'll just measure or estimate the, the diameter at breast height. Um, or the stream width is obviously very important. And the difference between a one meter wide stream and a five meter wide river are, is really important. So we want to record that information. Here's the, the different categories of substrates on the leaf or on the stem or a twig or a trunk on an epiphyte, under the bark, in bank mud, bank sand or gravel, bank rock, all these different things here that you could add to or use as categories for your habitat data. So that's for substrate. Specif special things involve like other little categories, things like in a tree hole, and you add the, pr the height of the tree hole, like where a branch breaks off, and that cavity in a, in, a, in a trunk of a tree takes on water, and often we find larvae inside those areas. Um, uh, here we can estimate the steepness of the bank of the, or the banks of the river if the animal was collected on the bank. That's actually really important data. But you can see, like, if you record all this stuff with these very simple codes, where you just read across this and you A, H, 30 centimeter, C, 2 meters, and you write it all across, it can take you 20 seconds. And you have complete habitat data for every single specimen. And so this is a way to very quickly assign every single specimen very specific habitat data. So obviously, this requires that while you're out with your bags and bag, plastic bags collecting um, frogs, that you're putting every frog in this system into a separate bag. And in that bag, you're putting a note that has your original um, identification number. So some people, as Dave mentioned earlier, take their tags, their field tags, that they're eventually going to tie on the specimen. They take those in the field with them. And as they catch the frog, they pull off a tag and throw it in the bag with the frog. That's a great way to do it. Or you can just cut up little pieces of paper and put that same number on it and throw it in the bag. I've seen it done both ways. Special, OK, here is uh, an example of a filled in data set here. Complete data that I just made up for today. Dave Blackburn, 2015. Again, start a new page if you move to a new locality every time so you have no question that these locality data 
apply to all the specimens that you would fill in on this page. And here is a collector number, species identification, the, the day and the month that goes with this year, the time, this was collected in primary rainforest, it was collected on the bank, one less than a meter from the, from the water, this was collected on a bank rock that was 30 centimeters in diameter, the stream which was three meters, it was collected on a rock, actually on the rock, and it was a male specimen that weighed 33 grams and 50, 50 millimeter snout vent. And you have complete data for every single thing. And then of course you put the coordinates over there, under the et cetera section, just for town. Okay, so um, I went through that. I know that's kind of laborious to just think about all these categories of all this stuff you might want to do, but I, I think this is a really important thing to demonstrate that one can get complete and unique data for every specimen with minimal effort using a system like this. Okay. I really want to talk about frog calls, since we've heard Mark earlier talking about vocalizations in birds. And we have an advantage with amphibians, and that's that we have a much higher probability of being able to catch the individual specimen that's making the call. And that means we can do all sorts of things with the analysis and co-curating the actual call that was produced by the actual individual that made that call, and having those records all go together, and having a really rich, beautiful data site set. So I want to show you um, some examples of some frog calls because these are just four categories um, that are radically different and, uh, and some of you look like you're falling asleep in the back there. So um, these are four different call types. I'm not going to move just yet. I'm just going to show some examples first. So um, I'm just going to show you first some constant frequency calls. And what I mean by constant frequencies, this is a sonogram here. And these are graphs, whoops, these are graphs of the frequency of the frog call versus a two um, second time. These, all the axes of these are all the same. This is two seconds on the, the horizontal axis and the, the frequency, the pitch of the call on the vertical axis. And this, we're going to start with constant frequency calls. And what I mean by constant frequency is they just go, that frequency doesn't change over the course of the call. It's one frequency, and this is about 3.5 kilohertz, I think. One frequency right across the, the, whole, whole, the whole call. And so here's the first one. Is this going to work? Do it here. It's a constant frequency call. Cool, huh? I love that frog. This is a complex call. So this is a two-syllable call, and you're going to see two calls. The first call is right here, this, group, this cluster of, of noise, and here's the second. And you can see it's two syllables. Here's one frequency syllable here, which is higher, and then it shifts to a lower one here. So it sounds like peek, and each one has a different, and each call has two syllables to it. And these are complex calls or multi-syllable calls. And this is a species that does that. Here are the two calls, like that, right? Here is an example of a frequency sweep call. And so this is what I mean by frequency sweep is this, the call starts here and the frequency is lower. And then towards the end of the call right here, the frequency has gone up. So it's a frequency sweep. And that sounds like like that. So here's a frequency sweep. Hear that? Frequency sweep. And here are some pulse calls. And a pulse call is over that two, those two seconds, it makes a rapid, you know, a rapidly pulse call. And here's an example of a species that makes a rapidly pulsed call. Ah. Now this brings up a really interesting thing. Do you hear what's going on be before that individual actually calls? Do you hear, listen to the background. Hear that? There's a lot of, do it one more time. There's a bunch of frequency sweeps in the background. Hear those? That's another species of frog. So this recording has two species. There's a frog in the background making frequency sweeps, and then the focal subject is the one making the pulse call. So I'll come back to that, what you do when you have multiple species in your recording segment. Okay, before I, I'm gonna go and show you how I do an actual recording, but first I wanna talk about the equipment that's necessary for um, or the basics of what you wanna record when it comes to frog calls. So first you need some equipment, um, and there's some, some basics of which equipment you're gonna need. You're gonna need um, to have, well the question is what data do we need associated with each, with each call? Um, and which data have to go with every single call? 
um, which data, uh, I guess the question is which data need to be recorded and where? Yes. yes. Yeah, I guess those two first things say the same thing. Which data need to be recorded and how they're associated with the calls. And the next question are which data are recorded where? Where do you put them? Do you put them in the catalog? Do you put them in your diary? Do you put them in your little field notebook? Or do you record them back into the call? Which data go with which type of recording that we have? I want to just mention backup of your data and data security. I want to mention why are all these types of things really necessary? I mean, sometimes people can just get carried away and are we actually going to use all these data and are they really important and how would they actually be important for all of us? And then what happens if some of the data cannot be recorded due to circumstances that you run into in the field and how can you accommodate for that? So the fundamentals are you need basically for frogs, you need a good recorder, a good thermometer, and a good microphone. And um, so here are the, the, the fundamental things on my bed last night of uh, ignore the computer. But here's a, a decent recorder, the microphone, a set of headphones, your notes, and here is a thermometer. And I like these old school, non-digital analog thermometers, just like the ones that we use as kids when we had a fever and your mom put your, the thermometer in your mouth. I like to use that basically that same thing. Uh, to just to keep everything as low tech as possible because they're, the quality of those data that are derived from those things are, are perfectly fine, but they're low tech and there's less uh, possibility for them to break down in wet conditions or things like that. So um, you really need, um, but what you do need, I mean, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna collect data for frog calls for use in analysis of any kind, a high quality recorder is very important. Now in a pinch, something is better than nothing. So if you have to record data with your iPhone, that's better than nothing. And if you have to record data just as the soundtrack in the background of your videotape, that's better than nothing. And we saw an example with Dave where he had a videotape of a frog, but he had the frog call in the background, and that's great. That's better than nothing. And if you can't get the temperatures, something is always better than nothing. But with a little bit of effort, you can collect everything, and every recording can be associated perfectly with a specimen and have complete data. And if you have those things of the, the frog specimen, and the frog call and the complete data, the value of that specimen just shoots way up. The value of the specimen that has complete data individually associated with it is orders of magnitude more important for biodiversity work and for any analysis that you might do in the future. So I just wanted to make that point. The other thing is that um, if you're gonna do this seriously, a good microphone is really important. Um, and I like to use um, these microphones and I'll come around and show people uh, more closely and, and we can also, I'd love to, if people want to go through the exercise of how we do this and want to take some time later this evening or when we go in the field, I want to let people play around with this. But a good microphone, which sometimes can be pretty expensive, um, in fact some microphones are more expensive than some recording units, a good microphone is actually really important, especially if you're recording um, frogs that call in choruses. So imagine a pond here with 50 hyperoleus calling around it, these little reed frogs, this is a, a directional microphone that when you point it, it records an area about this big. It's, it's, it records in a, in, a, in a steep axis and records only what you're pointing it at. That's really important if you have you know, a frog here and then 30 other frogs all around the pond that you record the one frog that you really want. Of course, with birds, the bird is way up in a tree and you'll see the birders use microphones that are this long because they're taking a field of a recording area that's about the size of a trash can lid. And sometimes even bird people use an, a, a parabola or a concave shield that goes around the back of the microphone that helps focus the, um, the recording in a particular spot and eliminates with these directional microphones what we call off-axis sound, sound that's in the background over here. We just want to record the one subject that we're after. So I'm going to put, put this down while I talk about a few things. I hope I didn't just break my thermometer. Um, yeah, so much for old school. Wish I had a digital one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so let me talk about which data need to be recorded and why while I check out my thermometer. This would be really embarrassing if I... Whew. Okay. It's all right. Um, okay. We already talked about the sort of basics of we need the date, the time, the identity of the frog, but um, when we're doing this, um, it's also when we're actually doing uh, these recordings, because the recordings will be managed separately, and we've heard about some of, the, some of the resources and some of the platforms for managing acoustic data, because the, the calls may be managed separately, either on the Macaulay Sound Lab or on eBird or, or iNaturalist or one of these platforms, each recording 
you're going to want some extra data, like who it was that made the recording, the identity of the recorder, the person, or the recordist, as some people say. You're going to want that information associated with the record of the call, because that'll be important if the call is, is not co-curated with the specimen at a museum, but is served somewhere else on a different platform. Um, you're going to want that frog recording number um, for that date. So what I like to do, um, and what a lot of amphibian biologists do, is characterize it as this, as the Rafe Brown recording number three for the 11th of August, 2008. So for each day, you start a new number and you say, this is my first recording for August 11th, 2008, and the next frog you record, this is my second frog for the 11th of August, 2008. And then when you put that information back in your field notes, the catalog that I just showed you, you have that date that goes with every specimen. And if you just put recording number three, then you, and it matches it all up perfectly. I'll, I'll show you examples of that later. But at a minimum, with each recording segment, you want the same stuff. The locality, the elevation, the forest type, atmospheric conditions or notes on recent weather stuff. You want the speciation or your best guess of, or species or, or identification or best, best guess of that animal. You want the air temp before the recording, the temperature, and I'll show you why this is really important. You want to record the call itself, and what I would recommend would be 10 to 25 calls per specimen. And I showed you some examples of paired calls, of two calls, but basically what you want is a statistical sample of calls per each specimen. And I'll just mention this now and then I'll come back to it. Sometimes people make the mistake of thinking, well, more is better, so I'll just let this recorder run for five minutes. And they record 150 calls for a single specimen. Well, when you actually go and analyze those, you're probably going to use 25 or 30 of, if you have 150, you're not going to use them all. A statistical sample is like 30 things. So you really want like 30 calls, 20 to 30 calls per individual. And you're, if you're trying to manage your time, it's best to then go on and start recording other individuals and getting 20 to 30 calls per those individuals rather than leaving your microphone going for five minutes and getting 150 or 200 calls for one frog. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you more about that soon here. 